That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tomb, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me here in person. <laughs> and to those of you that are joining us online, I want to welcome you this morning. Uh, my name is Darcy Stockdell. I'm the ministry assistant and accountant here at Garland. And I just want to say hi. <laughs> um, today is November 15th. Oddly, it's exactly eight months to the day that we started this strange thing of being mostly online. It's hard to believe that it's we thought then that we might be better by now, and here we are. So just um, continued to pressing into what that means and to, um, to still be the church, even though we're in all these different places. So thanks for, for being with us this morning. Um, this morning, um, we're going to continue with our uh, re-envisioning of what our mission is and remembering what that is. The, the journey of Garland Church is to know Jesus, to journey with him and share him with the world. And um, Pastor Rod and the team will be sharing more about what it looks like to journey with him um, a little bit later. I just th keep thinking about um, 
this place of being in the worship center together, worshiping together, that really um, we hope that this is a place where you come to know, know Christ in a way that you haven't before. And may you like experience that today, even as we worship together. Um, I want to read Ephesians 3, 16 to 21 as a prayer, if you'll join me in, in praying this as you prepare your hearts for worship. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be, that, to be, that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Holy Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Will you stand and join us?
pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for being here with us today. Wherever we are, you are here with us. Lord, in this strange and odd time where I just am so thankful and in awe that even in the weirdness that you have brought us to a place as a church where we're re-examining what we really believe and what you really want us to do. I don't think there's any mistake in how you're using this time for us to be quiet and still and listen to your voice and to learn and to know what it is that you want us to do. Lord, as we seek to know you, I think about the scripture where you um, you delivered people physically and spiritually in the way that was perfect for them because you knew them. Lord, I want to know you in the same way that we can have a relationship together that you understand me and I understand you and, and, the, and the ways that you um, act and, and minister to the world. I want to follow you. I want to journey with you in the ways that, um, that are, are your ways and not just a reworking of my own ways. I want to look at what you do, what you did, what you do each day, and I want to follow that to minister to this world. Lord, in the, the difficult times that, that each of us may be facing, what I'm facing, what if instead of seeing that as I want to be delivered to get out of the pain of that, I ask, Lord, what is it that you want to do through that? Help change the way I think, the way we think, and to use it to whatever experience it is for your purposes and your glory. Lord, we want to share our love, share your love with the world. What does that look like? I think some people are good at just um, sharing with others or ministering to them, Lord, and some of us have a hard time. Lord, it can never be out of our own strength that we do that. It's by your Holy Spirit that you enter into our life and you transform us and to bring us to a place of overflowing that we can't help but share your love with others. I just, I pray that that would be true for all of us and that as we walk this journey, it's not just something, not just a thing we say or a thing that's on our wall, but it's something that we live each day. So as we enter into, um, finish, continue on with the worship this morning. Just help us to keep that in mind and to look for you in all the ways that you are present in our lives. In your name, amen. Y'all can have your seats. Good morning. Um... I'm getting my act together here. So I wanted to t let you know a couple things. What's up with this? <laughs> wow. Okay, I wanted you people to know this morning that. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, kids, you can gather in the back with Anne. Uh, Thank you, Ann, for serving these kids. And uh, kids have a great time with her. And Addie, thank you, Addie, for serving as well. So uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a, like what's going on thing for a moment before we continue looking at uh, the scriptures and, and talking about you know the way we feel God is leading us and what that means for our own activities and such like that. But, so talking COVID talk, uh, you know, we don't know any more of what's going on than you do. We're, we're just people. And when I say we, I suppose at this moment, I'm thinking especially about the leadership board. We just met this last Tuesday and we're talking about this idea of the upsurge in numbers. And, and uh, you may recall that the reason we're allowed to meet uh, right now in this very gathering is that we have a very unique exception 
uh, at least in the state of Washington, although other states, whatever they're doing, we're the only entity that's allowed to meet. <laughs> and uh, while some are very, still very angry uh, that, uh, that about things that relate to this, um, uh, I've been very thankful that we've been allowed. And uh, anyway, I, as I understand it, Governor Inslee is going to be making some big statement this morning, and that statement may indeed clamp us back down again. Uh, I want you to know that the leadership board's perspective remains, you know, that this is a matter of, of service to our society, that we're, that this isn't, you know, in, in American citizenship terms, uh, this is not a religious liberty issue. This is a public health matter that goes beyond that. We're not being unfairly picked on again, I say. In fact, we're the only ones that have been allowed to meet. <laughs> so I think we're uniquely allowed. And we'd say, well, but aha, as Americans, but we have this right. Uh, but last I looked, people that get COVID are Christian and unchristian. And last I looked, people that die from COVID are Christian and unchristian. And uh, God calls his church, I think, throughout, throughout all times and places to be of service uh, to their community for the good of that community and uh, the good of his message in, in this world. So all I'm telling you is the leadership board will continue to roll with whatever, you know, we get told, you know, or asked or however you want to think of it to do uh, as a part of this society. And, and so it could mean if he comes out and comes up with something, you know, it could mean already that we'll have to go back to only online. And if, if that's required, then we'll do that. And uh, we'll continue to roll with it and we'll try to, try to stay connected and try to support you and, and all of that. And, and uh, I'm speaking to those of us who are here present as well as those who are online. And uh, I'm just really thankful for the way it's been. Naturally, then, as a leader in our circle, I think, oh, what does this do to all our plans and everything and stuff? And you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to know. I don't know if you think I or the leadership board should have it all figured out. But this is a matter of faith. And uh, I, I, I remain convinced that Jesus Christ is worth following and stuff that... Wait, we have to stop right here and now and give Eric a hand because he has sat in the section. Before you got here, Eric, I just said, what happened? Nobody wanted this section. You're the man. Thank you for holding it down. Um, you know, so will you, I guess I'm just asking as you continue to hear about the kinds of things we're saying, you know, I, we are trying to walk by faith. We're trying to trust the Lord, depend upon him. I don't have all the answers, you know. Some of you are bummed about this and bummed about that. I don't know, but uh, we're trying to follow the Lord, trust Him, and do our best uh, in this very unique, unprecedented time. And uh, so I suppose what I most ask for is for your goodwill. I ask for your unity, you know. I ask for your prayer, for your dependency upon the Lord, and uh, the Lord will not only get Garland Church through it, you know, in some way or form as he thinks is right, uh, but he'll get Spokane and Washington and our nation and this world through it as well. So that's just about as straight as I can tell you, you know, we're trying to do what we're doing and think that God put it on our heart, but uh, we'll just, we're just trusting God with all of these changes as they happen. Uh, we'll keep you informed as best we know. Amen to that. Is that okay? All right, let me pray about it anyway. And uh, so if you join with me and in just entrusting all this to the Lord. Father God, I feel so totally inadequate. Uh, the, it seems like, like the requirements of this time uh, so often go beyond what we, what we know, what we, what we have the capacity to pull off. Um, we just admit we are needy in every way. Uh, as this virus continues to swirl around, we know that you know. We ask and plead for your compassion upon all people. Your word says that you are compassionate, that you are faithful to every generation. And we ask you, God, to be faithful to us, to this generation, to this crowd that lives today. Um, please put a, put a stay 
to this virus. Um, we are encouraged by vaccine talk and such, and we, we assume in human terms that this is the fix. Um, we know in spiritual terms that the fix for all is anchored in you, but yet every good and perfect gift comes from you, Heavenly Father. And so all good is from you, and we just plead for your good to be upon us, this church, upon us, this city and state and nation, and upon us, this world. Please hold this virus at bay. Uh, please allow healthfulness to track across this land, across this world. Um, and the, specifically, the subset of what it means for Garland Church and our journey and our, our desire to be uh, on one mission with you. Uh, help us with that. Help me, help the leadership board, help the MAG-7, the 27, and all of us collectively. We throw ourselves at, at your feet and just say, this is your thing, God, and you do with it as you feel is right, but we present ourselves. Here we are. Send us. Thank you, Lord. Um, may, may you uh, continue to inspire and fulfill and be everything that we need. May my words, my meditations, may our words, our meditations be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've just finished election season. And uh, I don't know if you feel it, but I'm with, to some relief for me that at least the thing is, is decided and we're moving along and whatever will happen will happen with counts and stuff. I don't know all that stuff. But I'm thankful that... Uh, you know, all this cantankerous thing at least isn't quite as hot as it, as it had been. But of note, over the next few months, as these various elected officials start to take their places, uh, they are going to be stepping up and taking an oath of office, I would say the oath of office, because it is the same oath of office that's delivered to every, every person that serves in the armed services or in, uh, you know, in, in civil service. And it, and it goes like this. I, I took this oath once myself. I state your name, okay? You know, so I go Rodney F. Cosgrove. You know, having been appointed, you know, as whatever it was, you know, this is, it's written down here as a second lieutenant the first time I took this oath of office. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, okay, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear faith, true faith, interesting, true faith, you know, and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely. Nobody's forcing me or the people to do this. Take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, trying to get out of it in some way, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a way to get out of this somehow, I'm, and I've got that in my mind, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. This is an oath. It is a promise. It is, it is, it is a prayer before God. You know, I've only taken a couple of oaths in my whole life, and the, other, the, the only other one I think of really is my marriage. I, you know, I gave an oath to my wife that I would be there in sickness and health, rich, poor, till I die. That was a promise I made, and this is another promise. And I first did it myself as a second lieutenant when I got commissioned on May 17 of 1990, and then I took this oath again on December 1 of 1998, incidentally, the first day that I came on staff here to serve Garland Church. I, I also uh, swore in uh, to the Washington Air National Guard. And then you do it at every promotion in between. So I've taken this oath several times, and I've also issued it many times, you, this, this, this oath to other officers at their promotions and such, or commissionings. And then there's a variant of it uh, for the enlisted corps that's just a little bit different. 
these are, this is a legally binding promise. I mean, technically the military doesn't have you until, until you do this. And the moment it happens, you could literally be like, you know, and off you go to war, so to speak. It could be, it could be that. And then again, this, as I tell you, this is the same oath that, you know, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers is going to take as she re-ups her commitment and every other elected official, by the way, except for the president, which has a slightly different variant. That person has a different oath of themselves, but which, I don't know, I don't know all the history behind that, but theirs is slightly different. So this commitment is a really big deal, and, and it can be very costly to the ones who choose to make that commitment. So I remember thinking myself, and I think this would apply to anyone that chooses to do this, that such a man or a woman needs to count the cost about this commitment that they are making. During Jesus' ministry on earth, he traveled around his, with his disciples. He was teaching, he's healing, he's calling people to repent of their sins and turn to God. And he said that the reason for this was because the kingdom of God is, was, was, is near. But one day as Jesus and disciples were up near Caesarea Philippi, which is in the north part of Israel, Palestine, he began to tell his followers that soon enough things were going to start to turn sour for him. He was going to be rejected, that the leaders and the authorities at many levels were going to come against him, and eventually, in fact, he would be killed. But he also stated that after three days, he would rise again from the dead. And as he spoke about this to his disciples, Peter, who is starting to rise in his leadership in a certain way, starts thinking to himself, this is not how this goes, Jesus. And in so many words, he takes Jesus aside, and the narrative says that he reprimanded Jesus for talking like this. Reprimanded is the word. It's really interesting. Tell you what, Jesus would have none of this. He listens to what Peter says, and then he looks at all of his disciples at that moment. So, you know, we think of that as the 12, but remember, disciples is a loose term. There's always more available around the outside. And he reprimands Peter, and this is what he says. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, hey, all you people, come on around. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, the gospel, which they don't even know what this is yet, barely. If you give up your life for my sake, my sake, Jesus, and the sake of my message, you will save it. Whew. You know what? There are different points of view on everything. <laughs> it's human nature to think that we see it the way that it really is. We project ourselves. We study, think, wonder, listen to people, try to figure it out. Into it comes our style of thinking, our personality, and we decide the way that this world is. We're all on this journey trying to like figure it out. And once we figure it out, we work our way through life with this sort of tentative plan about how it all goes. And most things seem to go okay. 
And then sometimes things happen that challenge our ideas of the way it all works. Where do I fit into this? What's it like? What's God like? How do I relate to him? Well, I always thought it was like this, but this situation's happening, and that makes me think differently. And so many times we're in this issue of developing perspective or viewpoint. But usually we're just operating inside of ourselves, just kind of doing what we do according to the way that we think it goes. And then we encounter other people, and we realize that they see things differently. Jesus, in this case, has counted the cost, and he sees it, his eternal mission as self-sacrifice, which is very different from Peter's viewpoint of the way that things are to go. So Jesus sharply corrects Peter. Hey, Peter, your voice is like Satan speaking to me. You are seeing things, power word, merely, merely from the human point of view. You're not seeing this from God's perspective. Remember, the human view makes complete sense from our angle. We can't see it from anything else but our own angle. It's very difficult for us to try to walk in somebody else's shoes, so to speak, and see it from their side. We always default to our own viewpoint, our own sight, our own vision, what we see. But there is another way to say it all, and the way that it could be seen is God's angle. And in fact, listen to me, everybody, Jesus basically is saying, if you want to be my follower, you must do three things. And from your perspective, they may seem crazy, but from God's perspective, they make perfect sense, and they are the essence of what it means to journey with me. So at this point, I want to swing and, and emphasize the thing that I think we most need to pay attention to as we think about this. To journey with Jesus means to live into his version of the abundant life. His version of the abundant life. His perspective. Not just the human view. Not just your view based upon the way you see it all. The way you even see God and how he operates and how he, the church and how it all happens is still a formulation of our human point of view. But we are constantly pressed. And journeying with Jesus means trying to see it from his angle. How does he see it? His angle is abundant. It's living and it is life. That alone is a different angle than the worldly angle. So what leads me to say this? Well... It's those three things that Jesus is pointing out. Number one, give up your own way. Think of the Fleetwood Mac song that says, you can go your own way, but that's not quite this, is it? You know, I search up images and stuff like that. And when I type in my way or, you know, Usually, the, everything that came up was like, you do it your way. <laughs> you, should, you be sure of who you are, and you do it like you do it. That's not this. That precise image corpus of stuff that I was seeing is exactly what this does not mean. In the Luke environment of this statement, Jesus says, put aside your selfish ambition. Selfish ambition that couplet appears in a few other places in Scripture. In Philippians 2, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but consider others better than yourself. And in James 3, James says, Wherever there is jeal jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and, every, and evil of every kind. Selfish ambition going your own way. 
To journey with Jesus is to give up, give up your own idea of how things should go. To stop inventing in how you can acquire all the things you want and to forgo trying to achieve all the various goals you have set. <laughs> it's completely unnatural in every way when viewed merely from a human perspective. But it is exactly what is required from those who follow Jesus because while this is the way to life, it is indeed so completely otherworldly. This is why people think you're so wacko if you choose to follow Jesus. Just stuff like this. So he says, give up your own way. Secondly, he says, take up your cross. The Greek word for cross is stauros. S-T-A-U-R-O-S, stauros. It is an ugly sounding word for an ugly concept and an ugly uh, practice. It's an irony that we have put it in our jewelry and made it something we think is beautiful. While we know for a Christian it represents something beautiful, a stauros is not beautiful in any way whatsoever. In my mind, it's not that much different from Sauron, which is, you know, J Tolkien's antagonist in his epic Lord of the Rings, you know. And Tolkien himself was a Christ follower, so I often think to myself, did he mean this connection? I don't know. But despite that, this is a subtle thing going on, but it whacks us. It is a fascinating statement when you realize that Jesus says that taking up our cross is something that happens before his own crucifixion. They do not have context for him saying this as it relates to his own life. But they do get it from a Roman perspective. They've seen it time and time again. They've seen criminals and enemies of the Roman state dying on crosses set beside the main roads just outside of Jerusalem and all of the other major cities. This practice copied from the Phoenicians was reserved for the worst of the enemies of the state of Rome. It was a bloody, ruthless way to die. And Jesus was actually using this picture to tell them something about their relationship to him. <laughs> Willingly take this cross. I'm not forcing you. You choose. He could have said, sit in your electric chair. He could have said, hang in your noose. but these methods of execution would not have been as brutal. In every case, the call to follow Jesus won't cost you simply a token sacrifice. It will not cost you a few bucks at a holiday drive for the children or something like that. It doesn't mean you just pick a few clothes you don't want and give them to the Union Gospel Mission. That is not this. This has everything to do with grisly death. And it is exactly what Jesus is inviting everyone who follows him to do. To literally be willing to die like him in this way. So to journey with Jesus means to completely end our own priorities. To stop going our own way and to go the Jesus way instead. Finally, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Give up your own way. Take up your cross. Follow me. Take the oath to support and defend the person and mission of Jesus Christ. I told you I took the oath of office once, but my commitment to Christ supersedes that. It is higher than doesn't mean this is irrelevant, but this one is higher. And once I took that oath, so to speak, to Christ by accepting and choosing to follow his way, 
And I've made numerous recommitments in my life to continue that way. And every time life gets upside down and confusing and I don't get it and I'm going my own way, I have to, just like you, if you're walking with Jesus, say, not my way, but yours be done. Not my will. This means facing rejection, ridicule, troubles of all sorts. But it is what Jesus is calling us to. And no one who understands Jesus' call ever decides to do this casually because the costs are too high. I mean, at least if we understand what it means. It doesn't matter if you assume you're a Christian simply because you live in America, that you show up to this church, that you do stuff, that you serve, you're involved, you lead, you whatever. That doesn't matter in these terms. It doesn't matter if your grandfather was a minister. It doesn't matter. It's about you and Jesus. Are you personally journeying with Jesus while surrounded by his community, which is a distinct part of living in his body, the church, of going where he goes and doing what he does? So if you choose to do it all by your own way rather than going Jesus' way, if you choose to try to save yourself rather than accepting Jesus' stauros, if you choose to follow your own plan, your own ideas for the way you think your life should go rather than following Jesus, then you are certainly on the trail of trying to save your own life. But you know what? Jesus says it won't work. It won't work in the end. You know what? It actually won't work in the meantime either. You will scrape and claw and always lack for the inner peace and the inner direction, the inner connection with the God who made you, formed you, knows you, understands you, and directs you out of his security that he gives you as a son and a daughter of Christ to live in his way. Uh, that's good stuff. And I wish the world knew that. Actually following Jesus, you know what? It works. <laughs> it works. It gives a foundation and a reason and a, and a center for life. And walking with his family, journeying with his family, while it has its challenges, what thing in life doesn't works to be surrounded by his people, journeying with Jesus as he sanctifies and helps us all the more reflect him. Uh, that's good stuff. It may seem upside down. It may seem countercultural. But this is the way to life. And those of you who know Jesus and follow him, as I think most of you do, know what I'm talking about. This is the pathway to life. Not my will, but yours be done. So we're excited about this. I'm excited about this. And this is so much of what it means for us to try to recommit ourselves to the Lord and his way. As a church, to organize ourselves around this mission to tether ourselves to Christ in this way alongside of his people. I hope that you will come along. Let me pray. Father, um, thank you. Uh, this idea of committing ourselves to you, this idea of following you, of taking up our cross, this idea of not going our own way, Lord, help us. I pray that if anyone here physically or watching online I pray that if these, any of these don't know you, don't know what I'm talking about, or just unsure, that they would choose you. They would set aside their sinful ways, repent, and turn to you. Lord, we know this is, this is the only way, but this is a broken world, a lost world, an angry world. <sighs> Come, Lord Jesus, and save, we pray. Help us in this, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay. So, uh, I'd like uh, the, the, the dwindling members of the MAG-7, let me explain why dwindling, uh, to come on up here if they would. And, uh, 
And we are gonna interact with you up front just as we have been for uh, the past couple of weeks. And we're dwindling because we're seven, but see only C3, why is that? Well, Mike Sloan isn't feeling well. Uh, Kathy Hansen, um, uh, she had a power outage this morning and wasn't able to come. And uh, Joanna, well, Joanna's still staying at home and uh, you'll see her as she, as she uh, shares her story, her faith story in a few minutes. And uh, did I miss anybody? Ron. And Ron, Ron lives in Pilot Grove, Missouri for the moment. <laughs> so you get us. Um, but hopefully that's exciting to you. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> These are people I've grown to love and uh, been so thankful to journey with them. So as we've been doing, uh, we're going to explain some of our plan. And we believe that this is what God is, is leading us towards. And uh, we want you to come along. So will you please listen? Will you hand it out? I handed, uh, you, you received that paper as you came in. This is just a copy in our, uh, of, of that middle segment. Remember, our big movements are no journey and share. This is the journey section. So uh, if you received that, just listen well. Mel is going to read it, and you can just read along with that, and then the three of us will discuss that uh, for a time as we've been doing. We journey with Christ by growing in faith while surrounded by his community. The primary settings where we see this occurring would be the worship gathering. The worship gathering is a place to journey with Christ through scripture, worship, prayer, sacrament, and story alongside other seekers as a committed part of this larger group. Journey groups are the primary life of the church and help us grow more like Christ in a small group biblical community focused on scripture, worship, prayer, serving, and sharing the good news about Jesus with others. Since every group's primary purpose is to make disciples, each group chooses an outside of Garland ministry to be carried out by the group that facilitates service and witness to the world. Additionally, life on life discipling, mentoring relationships are encouraged. The MAG-7 team will not choose specific ministries that will be carried forward. Instead, groups will choose from existing ministries or pursue a new one as the Holy Spirit leads that group. Lastly, serve teams focus on specific ministries or organizational needs within the church, such as the worship gathering team, the connections team, the youth ministry team. Basically think about that as what makes us work, what makes us tick on a Sunday um, each week. Um, a moment that matters could be when a person discovers their ongoing need for transformation in the character of Christ and chooses to continue on their faith journey in a journey group or our small group biblical communities. Or another moment that matters could be when a person realizes the desire for others outside of the church family to know Jesus, and they begin to actively share what they have experienced. This moves them to share to the share phase. Okay, thanks, Mel. So uh, as, as a means of helping to connect this idea of, of not going our way, but going Christ's way, of taking up Christ's cross and following him, I wonder if, if either of you would be willing to share something in your life about how you've been helped on this journey by being a part of this church. How is, do you have any interaction with that? Well, I've been here for a long time now. I used to be one of the young ones with the little kids and, and I was only here for a little bit, but now it's like 15 years now or something. Um, so Garland Church has seen me through a lot. Um, and they've supported us in hard times, even stuff like bringing meals. Um, over the years, I've received intercessory prayer. That has greatly helped. Um, I love Garland. This is one of the things that we're taking from the old and bringing to the new. Garland is a place where people love well. 
We love each other well, and we take care of each other. And I think that this is one of the golden gems that we've pulled over from what we were to what we're going to be. And so I'm, I'm super excited to see that happen in a different way. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to think, because I still feel like I'm the new guy in this church. Mm -hmm. And on the Meg 7, I, I feel like I'm the rookie in the cop movie that's like, gee, fellas, I got an idea, but I'm not sure if it's going to... Um, but as... Can you restate the question again, please? I, I, I have an answer, but I want to make sure it fits your question. Uh, you know, this is a question aimed at synthesizing what we just talked about, about, you know, fo following Jesus, taking up our cross, how, uh, going his way, not our way. What's some ways that you've experienced that connection, uh, your, your own journey with Jesus and how that, how Garland has assisted or helped or Okay. Helped you to be to journey with this community. How is that? How has that helped you? Okay, so coming into Garland, I was because uh, I've only been here for three years. I think this year, maybe four. Um, I was kind of damaged goods. Uh, uh, my wife, my wife, and I got saved at a different church that doesn't exist anymore, and that church had gone toxic, and I was carrying around a lot of spiritual baggage that came mm. from that. Uh, with my experience at Garland here, um, there was a genuine sense that there were people here that cared about my spiritual well-being, uh, but they didn't have me on an agenda, a specific agenda that you need to be here, here, and here with an X amount of time, otherwise you can't serve in this community, which was a, kind of a rigid, a, a rigid plan that I had experienced elsewhere. Um, and so, really, uh, here at Garland, I was given space to heal and freedom to grow. Um, you know, I, I read through the entire Bible for the very first time as a congregate here, though having been a Christian since 2001. Uh, and that, that was important to me. I've since done it again, so I've done it twice now. Yay me. But... Um, given that freedom and space to develop who I am as a Christian instead of whatever system that was in place was telling me, no, you need to be here by this point of your journey. Um, it's really helped me to develop as a Christian and experience Christ in the way he wants me to be rather than in a regimented, uh, development plan, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to be, to be a little bit more specific, could you just clarify, like, what are some of the settings where you've experienced that, that peace or that space to be involved with people, but still to figure it out at your own? Well, funny enough, it's, it, it <laughs> I feel terrible saying this, but some of it kind of came from the standoffishness that we had to address with the, <laughs> mm -hmm. with the, uh, vital church. But, um, there's a lot of it, uh, that like came from outreach and, uh, gatherings that we had at Garland church, uh, through Wednesdays at Garland, which I dearly miss. Um, and just people allowing me to become involved with service teams, basically uh, joining in with the uh, worship team was key because so much of who I am or who I was at that time period revolved around music that it really took, it really allowed me to take how, you know, where I was at and kind of surrender that to Christ and like this is I'm giving this to you within the context of this community because at this point of time this is what I am or this is how I perceive myself and I and it was a continual process of surrendering and then opening myself to be able to uh, receive the care from the congregation within the communal aspect and that's always been something that I think Garland's been very good at is everybody here cares that, you know, people care when you're, when you're gone, when you show up again, people are like, where were you? We, we missed you. And, you know, even when it's accidental, like this last week when I missed the mag seven meeting and you know, I, I started getting contacted by people, we missed you there. Hopefully <laughs> everything's okay. So, um, yeah, it's just the genuine inter inter 
I, words are escaping me this morning. I apologize. I've been a little bit scattered this week. Interconnection? Yes, that's <laughs> the word. Uh, but the fact that, not that everybody's in everybody's business. I've seen that happen before. But it, it's just that people desire you to be better, you know. And in the same way that, not in a creepy, like, you need to be better than who you are. No, it's, it's more of a, they want to see you succeed. And they want to help you, help set you up for, help set you up for success. And, you know, in the same way, by doing that, you want to replicate that to somebody else. You know, and be like, I, you know, I want to see you succeed too. And it, it's kind of like that, I guess. Okay, cool. Thanks, John. So... As we're discussing, to journey with Christ implies certain commitments, and it also means that we journey with his community. So much of, of the Christian life is, is a life in community. And, uh, you know, we're describing that, that we, we really hope that a special touch point of that community will happen in small group biblical community. Uh, I wonder if uh, either of you, maybe you, Mel, uh, uh, could discuss what we see as a, as a well-rounded, you know, biblical community and how we think this can help people journey with Jesus. Um, one of the things that Vital Church came and said was that, you know, we, we were spread too thin. We were doing too many things. And so I think what the, the idea of the journey group, which is different than the small groups we've had, like, it really is going to be hopefully different than that. Um, this gives us an opportunity to come together in a purposeful way, in a purposeful group, keeps people connected with one another so that they can grow together. Um, we have decided that journey groups shouldn't be forever um, because people need different things. And so we haven't quite decided maybe six months or maybe a year, and then you'll move on to a different group because um, sometimes you go, you go to one thing and you kind of die there. <laughs> and you, know, you, get, you get stuck in it. So we want to give um, opportunity to move around and grow. Um, but those groups... Um, will meet together regularly. They will pray together. They will probably study something, whether it's talking about the sermon here or some other thing about the Lord. Um, they will care for one another. You know, this is the place where you, you, you need a meal and you call and you say, hey, we're really struggling. Hey, hey, can you help us move? Hey, um, would you just pray for me? I, I am... I am struggling. So they're going to be your, your rock, your, your system, and you're going to belong. Um, we will pray together, uh, we'll read together. Um, communion can be done in that setting or this setting. So I'm going through that list that said worship. Um, what was the list, Rod? Do you have it right there? I, yeah, worship, prayer, sacrament, prayer. Prayer, word, serve, yeah. witness. Okay, witness. So then that group will go the step further. They will pick a, um, a something to witness to, somebody, um, a mission to, to have for that group. And this can look totally different than what we've had before. It can look the same um, as some of the places we've invested before. But this is purposeful. And it's not just purposeful about service, because Garland has always been excellent at serving. We, like I said before, we love well, and we love here, and we love other people well. But this is to serve and to share the gospel. This is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And I think that is the, the hinge change in, in um, kind of what that small group will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Yeah, that, that's key. Uh, uh, a well brown you know, in a, in a small group community, we have the chance to live out the full range of what it means to be a Christ follower. And our invitation to you and to everyone online, really everyone, we want this to be the standard experience for people in the church to be a part of one of these journey groups. And uh, to do so uh, means you will, you'll participate in a ministry as well. We aren't going to, you hear a saying, perhaps, we're not going to dream up ministries that are kind of like shall we say, all church owned that we just then just hope that people will come and support. This would be to continue to possibly live into that 80-20 model, so to speak, where a few people do some stuff for all of us. Instead, this, 
enhances the opportunity for these ministries to go forward, whichever ones it is that a given group may select to do. Some of the ones that you've heard about that have been part of our local mission team and others that people have been interested in for years have the opportunity to continue forward if a group adopts that ministry and says, we want to do this ministry together and we want to speak of Jesus while we do it. And that, that is a shift from a program way of accomplishing the things we feel God is calling us to, to a community way where a group has the opportunity to carry that forward. These groups will have opportunities to re-up is what Mel is talking about. It doesn't mean you have to leave. It's not like that. That's not the point. But to enable a sense of movement at appropriate uh, uh, intervals uh, is, is something that we, we're excited about for all of us. So this is really, if you're looking for, like, uh, if you give me 10 eggs, <laughs> you know, six of them just got put into journey groups. I mean, this is very important, and we want uh, and invite the church to journey there and seek the Lord's face together and be that small group community. I'd like to say some of the most meaningful times in my life in terms of being helped along with Jesus have been in the context of community like this. Uh, I mean, I don't know where I'd be. Uh, early on when we became part of Garland Church, uh, we ended up being a part of a group at that time. Uh, those earlier groups have really never had the explicit sense of, of ex expect, expectation or hope that they'll carry on a, an, a, a, a ministry, a service ministry, and the, the call to share the gospel. That's not typically small group thinking. Uh, and that is not the way Garland has been in the past. This is why this is such a shift. Um, but I'm so thankful for the way that God has nurtured me and my wife and my girls in the context of small group community and some of my longest buddies in this church. You know, uh, Darcy's one of them, for example. She sent an, a, a very curious little photo a couple weeks ago where back in something like 1995 or six or something, me or Amy were calling the Stockdale family to invite them to our small group at that time. And she sent a photo. Why she kept this? I have no idea, okay? That's Darcy's problem, okay? <laughs> Don't judge her. Don't judge, okay? But she had this and it just noted who was in it. The Whites's, um, the Jorgens who have moved on, others. And uh, it was a precious time for us, and I was really curious to see that picture. Anyway, so you've heard us talk about journey groups. This is where so much is happening. We've also talked about serve teams. You heard her read that, and I wonder if you guys could clarify. What's the difference between a journey group and a serve team? Can people be involved in more than one? These types of few questions that they might be thinking. I, Mel, I see you look like you're yeah, on it. Yeah, I got, I got stuff to say. Um, <laughs> so first of all, really quick before I move on to serve teams, one of the things that I have envisioned as we have talked about uh, witness, um, journey groups and witnessing, you know, evangelism is hard. And a lot of times we walk away from a sermon sometimes and we're like, okay, I got to pin down my guy at work and I got to tell him this and, and, you know, I've been praying for so-and-so for so long. And I think that the opportunity to do that within a group, um, we can encourage one another. We can be praying for those people together purposefully. I mean, I know that we do pray, but, but joining together and having that be a goal of praying for that person that you want to see meet Jesus, um, growing together in those situations. Um, how do I share? Oh, you shared like that? Wow, I've never shared like that. Oh, how did that go? I just think that that is one of the big, big wins of this situation is that we get the opportunity to, to, you know, iron sharpen iron, to dig in there together and to encourage one another. And I think we will all grow and be richer for it. Okay, um, so and the difference between a journey group and a serve team. Yes, okay, journey group and serve team. So um, what we found previously is that um, we were running around doing lots of stuff, we've already said that, but uh, we are also having a hard time making Garland run we were having a hard time getting people into kids' ministry and, and, and maybe the youth and, and whatnot. So what we decided was that 
when we are serving Garland Church, that's within a serve team. So this is the stuff that keeps the lights on, keeps the walkway shoveled, keeps the Sunday morning going, keeps the kids' ministry going. So a serve team is literally you're serving here to help us continue on. Where a journey group is really important and we want you to be involved, um, that's just, it's just different than keeping this running. Um, there could be serve teams that help keep journey groups running. Um, so we're hoping that everyone will choose to be in a journey group. Um, not everyone will be in a serve team. Uh, we've even imagined there will be some of you out there, maybe you retired folks who have lots of time on your hand, will choose to be in a couple of journey groups because you have a missional heart and you see this mission and this mission and want to join in. Um, serve teams would be different than that. They're not the same. Um, you could choose to be in a serve team and not in a journey group. That's okay. Um, but we really want you in a journey group. And then out of that, serving um, here with what Garland does. So um, you certainly can be in both. We'd love you to start with a journey group, but we know that you know one size does not fit all. So you've got lots of options. Yeah, okay, thanks Mel. Okay, John, you, you can have the last word. So um, naturally we have we're trusting Christ and Jesus, you know, if this is of you, grant your, grant your grace. What are, what are our hopes about the way that people will respond to uh, this journey phase and the opportunities available to them? Um, really, what we want is 100% involvement. Um, with the plan that we've put forward, we believe the journey groups are where we're going to see the most spiritual growth within people. Um, and it's going to, and they'll produce the most opportunity for the next step, which is to share his love with the world. So that's one thing. Also journey groups from the way that I had envisioned it when we were talking about it are going to be the biggest tool to allow people to outreach on the level that they feel called. Um, in some of our meetings, uh, you know, it had been described that the journey groups are kind of like micro churches within the church or states within the federal government, so to speak. Um, and so, and how I had to like words, right? Earlier in a previous presentation that we had given, I had pointed out the fact that everybody has their own community they have that they're involved with. Um, like for, for me, mine's kind of the geek community and the podcasting community, because that's just something I'm involved in, the local music community as well. Um, but we, and so everybody has those, in, those unique communities that they have access to, and these journey groups are to kind of help solidify on those unique community vantage points that everybody has and make every individual an evangelist within those communities and to utilize that. Um, and that's the coolest part about the journey groups is they, despite the fact that they are the key point of the journey with Christ process in, in the, in the three-step process that we've laid out for Garland Church, they embody all three points of we want people to come into those and know Christ at that point, and we want to use them to share the share God's love to the world. And so our biggest goal is to use those as the main engine to drive the ministry plan going forward. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, none of this is going to happen unless God makes it happen. Uh, I invite you to continue to Pray and seek the Lord's face and ask for his enabling in your life and in the life of the community. Uh, I'd like you now to have an opportunity to hear Joanna Cop share her faith story. Uh, following that, uh, we'll have a closing song and then uh, a closing prayer, and you'll be dismissed after that closing prayer. So let's, let's listen to Joanna now. Good morning, my name is Joanna Kopp and I am a member of the MAG-7 team. And today I wanna to share with you my testimony of how I came to know Christ and my journey with him. My journey started when I was very small. I was a 
um, pastor's kid. I grew up in a Christian home and very blessed and thankful for that experience. When I was about seven years old, I went to a Wednesday night Bible study, um, Wednesday night Good News Club, where I heard the gospel about how Jesus died for my sins and how we needed to accept him into our hearts. Now, I had heard this information before, but it had never been or I had never understood it before as a decision that I needed to make. And as a little girl, I heard this and I thought, I do not want to go to hell. And I believe this. And I also thought, I've never made this decision. I've never prayed to God to ask him to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. And this is probably something that I should do and I want to do. But I was very nervous. And so I didn't talk to my teacher that night, but as I went home, I talked to my mother and I said, you know, how do we, how do I become a Christian? What do I need to do? And so my mom and I prayed together on the edge of my bed and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. It was heartfelt. It was as a child understands and it was the start of my journey with Jesus. The idea of journey has really resonated with me because that is the perfect description of how I think about my faith walk with God. And the start of this journey, it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't um, a life of, of, you know, entrenched sin. I was certainly a sinner, but I was seven. And um, it was just a really wonderful beginning to a walk with God. And I'm so thankful that thank you, thanks to godly parents and church and to my Sunday school teachers and Bible teachers and prayers and by the grace of God, that trajectory for me started very early. As I think about the journey in the early years, it was that childlike faith, that innocence, that trust, and I'm so thankful for that foundation. God helped me in really real ways as a child. I was often afraid of things like the dark and nighttime. And I remember I had a poster at the end of my bed that had um, just an encouraging phrase that helped me to remember to pray and ask God to help me in my fears. I liked to recite um, some of the Psalm, um, the 23rd Psalm walking in the uh, valley, shadow of the valley of death, and that kind of comforted me during that time. I also could be nervous about schoolwork and about tests, and so I would pray to God to ask him to help me be calm and to do well on a test and remember what I had studied. And I can think of times when I had difficulties with a bully and God um, spoke to me through some scripture that I had been reading and that comforted me and reminded me that God was building up character and strength in me. I loved learning. I loved going to church and to hearing about stories and reading. I loved hearing when we would have missionaries come and hearing their stories. I loved reading little devotionals that would have children who were uh, like fictional children who were doing great things for God and that inspired me and encouraged me. One thing that was uh, still that I was I was growing through and trying to understand at that young age was that I felt like I always had to re-ask Jesus into my heart, that I hadn't done it right, that I needed to say the right words. And so I had a lot of growing up and maturing in Christ to understand what it meant, what that uh, salvation moment meant for me and what it, um, how it would play out throughout the rest of my life. When I was 14 years old, I um, went to a church youth group event. It was a retreat. And there, God got a hold of me in a very real way that, in a real and a new and a, and a different way that I needed to, to experience to continue on my journey with Christ. And so while my salvation experience as a child was real and true, this was a furthering step on my journey with Christ. I remember I had a little card that I kept in my Bible. You might've had some of these too, you know, it has your name and what it means. And there's a little phrase there, God still speaks to those who listen. That was a phrase that while I didn't hear an audible voice from God at that time, I remember that phrase going through my mind. And it was just, I was just blown away and just on fire for Christ. 
I came home and I had a journal that I had been keeping. Uh, I, I love to write and many of these pages have just journaling, just typical Dear Diary kind of stuff. But January 7th, 2000, Dear God, I started and I wrote um, my experience at that retreat and how God had spoken to me and how God had changed me. And from then on, it, there are pages and pages here of me calling out to God, reading the Bible, being excited about my faith, wanting to share my faith, and, and just real life stuff too, you know? I was 14, 15, and so there's a lot of stuff about boys and schools and all that kind of stuff in there too. So God was really working and moving and changing my life. Another important thing during this time was that I was a part of a small group girls Bible study with my youth leader. And this was so important. We looked forward to getting together on Monday nights at Summer's house and reading the Bible and using concordances and dictionaries and studying books about other religions and how that, what that meant, you know, for us as Christians and all kinds of things. It was a really vibrant, exciting community. One thing that I am excited for as we move forward with our plan is the idea of our journey groups and what that is going to look like for our church. I'm very excited to see that vibrant community, uh, Bible-based, faith-based community that can grow um, for our church. After I had this experience, with God that was very pivotal. Pretty much the next year, I had a very, very difficult year. It was marked by not being able to sleep for some random reason, I had a lot of difficulty sleeping, which led to anxiety, which led to depression, which led to just this despair of, God, what are you doing? And I was so confused and so <sighs> calling out to God and where I had had one year where everything was on fire and you read the Bible and things are just jumping out at you. This year, I'm like, God, are, are you real? Why are you letting this happen to me? I'm a Christian. This shouldn't be happening to me. There's no good reason. This is just, it just seems like everything is just whew, the bottom out from me. And in my next journal, it looks a lot different. There are pages and pages where I am just like, God, just please help me. Please help me to feel better. Please help me feel better. Thankfully, due to, um, he, he, well, he didn't answer the prayers the way that I wanted to, just immediately, boom, zap, better. Um, but, but through prayer, through, um, through my parents, through, God, through counseling, through health professionals, God used that time and grew me and grew my faith. Now I had, and, and this is a, um, this was a really important experience for me because it grew my faith and my faith journey in a different way. Now I could say this faith has my trust in Jesus has, has been tested and been and gone through a really difficult time. And I don't understand it all. I don't understand why it happened. I don't understand lots of things. But God is still good and God is still true. And this is so important for me to share with you because a journey of faith with Christ is all of it. It's all of your life. It is ups, it is downs, it is the big parts, it is the tiny parts. It is a lifetime of walking with God. And he does want to walk with us through all of that. After that, I went to college. I went to a um, Christian college. I graduated. I became a youth pastor. Mary Tommy, we moved out to Spokane where we were gonna be missionaries. Then we ended up here in Spokane as missionaries. Um, we had Teddy and Thatcher and just, you know, all of these things that make up a life. 
And as I think about my journey with Christ now, I think about how I've had that innocent faith of a child, how I've had that fire of a teenager, how I experienced um, that doubt and that trusting in that dark valley. And, and that was just one of, you know, many times that have I've experienced throughout my life and probably will experience as my life continues. But I've learned how a uh, my walk with Christ, I want it to be a steady, steadfast, rich faith in him. I'm looking towards the future and what the journey with Christ will, t- will carry me to. And I'm excited about how God wants to use me, not just like if he does or if he doesn't, but understanding that like, I do have a purpose and ways that God wants to use me every single day. I'm serving him in my family, first and foremost with my kids and in my marriage and serving in the church and just excited to dream about the possibilities and the ways I can't even imagine that God can hopefully grow me and use me. I want to be able to see people come to Christ. I want to be able to witness to people and see people have lives that are changed. And as I think all the way down to the very end of my life, hopefully, God willing, if I get to die an old woman, I want to be one of those old, dear old saints that we probably all can think about who you speak to them and you know they're not perfect, but they have had a life a journey that has been walked with Jesus, that they have walked with Jesus throughout their whole life. And they have a richness and a quiet and a steadfast faith that leads them to the part point where they say, I am ready to meet Jesus. And so that is my hope that my journey with Jesus will just increase, continue to deepen and to strengthen um, until I'm ready to meet him. Thank you for letting me share with you.
I don't know about you, but every once in a while I think of a word that all of a sudden catches my attention in a way that it hasn't before. It's almost like it's in a foreign language or something. And just yesterday, I was just thinking about the word fellowship. And it struck me as different. And I was trying to wonder, what is that? What is fellowship? And I was struck with uh, a couple of verses in 1 John. And it says in John, 1 John 1, 3, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Then in verse 7 it says, But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I think that describes this journey with Christ perfectly. So, Lord Jesus... Draw us deeper into you. Help us walk in the light that we can have fellowship with the Father and with you. And in doing so, that we can have fellowship with each other. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to fellowshipping with you again next week.